So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Devin Fitzgerald, Curator of Rare Books in the History of Printing at UCLA Library Special Collections. And I'm pleased to welcome you to the final, the closing roundtable for the um, artists, uh, the Artists of Color Collective. Uh, now, uh, on behalf of the Bibliographical Society of America. Before we begin, let me remind everyone of the BSA Code of Conduct. I'll pop the uh, link to that in the chat in just a minute. Uh, and also, this event is being recorded, and so we ask that you agree to and participate by the Code of Conduct. The BSA conducts its business on the traditional and ancestral lands uh, and waters of the Lenape people in Lenape, uh, Lenape Hoking in Brooklyn, New York. I'm streaming from the San Bernardino Mountains, the traditional lands of the Serrano people. Society gathers people together at events like this one across, the, across North and South American continents on the traditional and ancestral lands and waters of indigenous peoples who were forcibly removed from their lands. We acknowledge the exclusion and erasures of indigenous peoples in the places where we work and gather. And we encourage you to type your local land acknowledgement into the moderated chat on your screen and share it with our community. This event will, will be closed captioned uh, by a live captioner in English. We're just waiting for them to arrive right now. Uh, and there will be machi machine generated translations of those captions in Spanish. Uh, once the captioner arrives, I'll share the link for the Spanish captions in the chat. Today's event will conclude with a question and answer period. To submit a question to our speakers, please enter it into the Q&A box. All attendees can see, comment on, and upvote questions. And we ask that you do this to help us prioritize questions of greatest interest to today's audience. We also encourage you to engage in conversations using Zoom chat, Zoom's chat features during today's talks. However, if you submit a question via the chat, I will ask you to re-enter it into the Q&A box. Before we begin, I would like to thank our co-sponsor, uh, David Solo, for joining us to make today's event possible. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Tia Blassingain, today's the moderator of today's panel. Uh, and Tia is an assistant professor of art at Scripps College and serves as the director of Scripps College Press. Uh, she's a book artist who needs no further introduction. Uh, and so with that, I'll pass it over to you, Tia. Thank you, Devin. Thank you everyone for joining us um, for today's conversation. I'd like to introduce uh, our panel. Um, we have Ashley Hairston Doughty, um, and she is a visual storyteller explaining personal experiences through verbal and visual language. Much of her practice deals with socioeconomic, racial, and gender-based issues, particularly those relating to cultural misconceptions and the development of personal identity. Although trained as a graphic designer, Doty's artwork often crosses multimedia, um, sorry, multiple media, including um, typography, illustration, writing, fiber, materials, and book arts. Um, Irene Chan is a multidisciplinary artist who works conceptually in print media, papermaking, installation, storytelling, performance, and book arts. She is an associate professor of visual arts, uh, founder and head of print media, um, and affiliate faculty at Asian, of Asian Studies at the University of Maryland, uh, Baltimore County. Devin Fitzgerald, um, curator of uh, rare books and the history of printing at UCLA Library uh, Special Collections, a specialist in Western and East Asian book history and a bibliographer. Devin researches the global circulation of East Asian books. Uh, and for time, I'm gonna keep going, but I'm gonna um, put everyone's bios into the chat. Um, Philadelphia-based artist Colette Fu makes complex three-dimensional compositions that incorporate photography and pop-up uh, paper engineering. Fu's, um, Numerous awards include a 2020 um, Joan Mitchell Artist and Sculptor Grant and a Fulbright Research uh, Fellowship uh, to China. Um, in 2017, Fu created the world's largest pop-up book measuring uh, 21 by 14 feet. Uh, we have Kanoe uh, Nishikawa, uh, 
Kanoe is an associate professor of English and African American studies at Princeton. His book, Street Players, Black Pulp Fiction and the Making of a Literary Underground was published by the University of Chicago Press in 2018. Kanoe is currently uh, at work on Black Paratext, a study of how book design has shaped modern African-American literature. Um, Radha Pandey, who unfortunately cannot be with us today. Uh, Radha is a papermaker and letterpress printer. She earned her BFA in book arts from the University of Iowa Center for the Book, where she was a recipient of the Iowa Arts Fellowship. Uh, Radha practices Europe. Uh, European, Eastern, and Indo-Islamic papermaking techniques, and teaches book arts classes in India, Europe, and the U.S. Curtis Small is a librarian and coordinator of public services for the Special Collections Department at the University of Delaware Library, Museums, and Press. In this position, he coordinates the reference circulation, I'm sorry, a reference instruction and exhibition programs, and also serves as a curator for the rare book collections. Curtis curated the exhibition Issues and Debates in African American Literature in 2017 at um, University of Delaware Library. And in 2019 uh, was a co-organizer of a Black Bibliographia Conference at University of Delaware. Um, so to start off, um, I wanted to ask a few questions and these are actually coming from um, our um, one of our sponsors, um, David Solo, to get us um, started. Um, so Black, Indigenous, and people of color, um, so BIPOC artists, um, are not well represented in some of the best known surveys of artist books. Uh, how should introductions to book arts, history, techniques, examples, um, deeper dive into equitably representing the ways in which BIPOC artists have been a part of the long history of artist books? Um, and how are you doing that in your own teaching or scholarship? And I'll open that up uh, for anyone who wants to start us off. Let's start. Hello, everyone. Um, so I wanted to say that this is something definitely that I'm, I'm lacking in. Uh, and it's something that I've been more conscious of just when this question was brought up to us um, a few weeks ago. And I'm mostly working alone in my studio and get immersed in my own projects. Almost all of my work revolves around the pop up book format. But occasionally I teach intensive workshops with different communities, whether from homeless shelters and kindergartens to universities. I often show examples of commercially published pop-up books, mostly of what's on my own shelf and books that I've purchased to learn from, mostly because they were innovative in some way, but mostly innovatively innovated by their um, te technical um, processes. And um, having recently taught a workshop at a university, I'm now more aware that almost all the books that I showed were made by men, white men, and only one that I showed was made by a woman who happened to be a good friend. And even her book was only available as a limited edition, produced edition. So I am making a conscious effort to, 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 be, to be better at that, at this. Um, and then quickly, I just pulled off a couple of books off my shelf that, that have some sort of diversity in them. Like this is Jerry Pinckney's book. Um, he illustrated it, but he didn't engineer it. Um, and, um, and he's from Philadelphia also. And, and then Sam Ita, uh, who um, is of Japanese American descent. So, um, but let me, I'm gonna share um, my screen now. So um, I, the, I think the most notable pop-up book made by a person of color would be Carol Walker's Freedom, a curious interpretation of the wit of a negress in troubled times. 
It tells the story of a female slave's life after emancipation. Her paper cutouts recall 19th century portrait silhouettes while at the same time subvert their function. Where in Walker's version, I quote from the Toledo Museum of Art, the demeaning postures and exaggerated features of her figures call attention to negative stereotypes of African-Americans often found in minstrel shows, novels, and art of the 19th and 20th centuries and reveal the corrosive power of stereotypes and prejudice. And uh, a book artist I've admired since I started making pop-up books 15 years ago is an artist with whom most of you already know, Julie Chen of Flying Fish Press. Here's her book, Chrysalis, which I find very appropriate to the times. Julie describes her book as, Chrysalis is an interpretation of the complex and transformative nature of the process of grief. Text and image within the piece refer to changes in the brain that result from a traumatic experience of loss and how these changes affect a person's perception of the world around them. Thank you. So I'm happy to jump in and I'll share my screen. How about me look? Very junky because I have a lot of things open. Um, so I guess on this question of how to incorporate, um, you know, for myself, I think a big part of um, in my teaching and position as director of Scripps College Press, um, I made a very conscious effort and I continue to make a very conscious effort and um, I would say unapologetic um, in trying to bring all sorts of artists to the classroom um, and in some way to our program, even um, if it's virtual. Um, and so since about spring 2017, um, I had taught a seminar class, um, basically race and identity in book arts. And part of um, the class was um, giving students the opportunity um, not just to spend time and read um, a variety of books uh, and hopefully create some prints at the end of the semester, um, but was actually to connect them and give them the ability to um, interview artists, um, curators, collectors um, around um, the, that subject matter. Um, and so um, we have a website, I'm happy to um, drop that link um, into the chat um, that sort of showcases the last few springs of that effort. Um, and so, um, you know, the interviews are brief, they're all done via email, um, but I think um, they have a nice range of people that we've um, interviewed um, emerging folks and more established people um, sort of um, to try to, you know, bring them together and show that they, they haven't been hidden. They, it's not that they don't exist. They've been there the whole time um, and they're doing some really interesting and strong work that absolutely should have been showcased before now and, and should be showcased in the future. Um, I would also say um, thinking about um, how you go forward to sort of correct those omissions um, I would say after last summer, it should be really easy because if every organization doesn't have some reading list or links to um, tons of organizations, um, you know, they should. Um, but also there are a lot of um, BIPOC artists who um, I think really took last year um, as an opportunity to make their own space and not wait for someone else to, um, you know, showcase them or highlight them. They're doing it themselves. Um, so um, like College um, Book Art Association, and I'll share this link as well, um, has kind of like a running list of, um, you know, different artists, um, essays, books, you name it, um, that at least that's kind of like a not really a deep dive, but it gets your, you know, your toes wet. Um, and then um, the International Print Center of New York um, also has um, a page, they have it under um, social justice print resources. Um, and so there are lots of different organizations um, that they um, highlight different efforts. Um, 
you know, readings, events, you know, there's so many things that have been recorded um, during the pandemic. And so that's a great resource. Um, my feeling is it'd be great if more um, institutions and organizations actually supported um, BIPOC artists and scholars to, <clears throat> you know, get their work out there for them to actually, um, you know, write books um, about their, their own folks and folks that they're interested in because clearly um, majority writers around um, book arts were not interested in um, significantly including non-white um, artists. And I'm hoping I'm stopping sharing my screen. Um, does anyone else want to share um, their responses to this question and how they might be um, you know, doing this in their own work? I'll say a little something. Um, so not to this, not specifically answering about um, the history of of um, book arts, but more um, about printmaking, because um, I teach a, a course at the university that is origins and issues in print media, and um, and it's heavily on printmaking. So I can answer about printmaking. Um, so when I so it's it's kind of like a, a survey course about origins, but then leading to contemporary um, printmakers or people who who artists who work in printmaking, and then uh, some on the origins of writing and early books. And so when I first a few years ago I first set off um, to to um, design this course. Uh, of course, I'm you know looking to include um, traditionally you know the the artists that that uh, have been recognized um, through history, and I am not a um, an art historian, a, a scholar. I am a, a studio artist, so uh, I'm coming from it from that standpoint. And so um, I, I yeah. So it was not that easy um, in the beginning looking. And so what I decided to do was each year to introduce. Um, a more diverse artists. So the first year I started with women artists because women artists are, are definitely so un, uh, unrepresented. And so I, I started with, with them first. Um, and at this point I have just under 40 that are not BIPOC artists, um, but then they're women artists. And then the next year I, um, I added African-American artists who do printmaking and also um, somebody in my class said, hey, you need more artists from African artists, you know, uh, artists from Africa. So I've also added some South um, African artists and also Nigerian artists who have a tradition of printmaking there. And then the the following year, I added Latinx, Chicanx, and then also Mexican, um, Latin American and South American artists. Um, and then the next time I teach it, I would like to add native and indigenous peoples around the world um, to, to find them and add them in. I have not added Asian um, artists, Asian American artists and Asian artists yet, because I feel that in the origin of, of teaching printmaking, we already talk about the origin of papermaking, which had originated from China. Um, and then um, some of the oldest printmaking with relief is um, is also from China, the oldest existing book that we see right now that is in existence right now. The Diamond Sutra um, was um, was also um, printed, um, originally printed in China. So I, I feel that, you know, we already, we uh, have already talked a lot about them, but they're definitely going to be in after Indigenous artists. So a couple of things. One is that um, after I had added the women artists in, I had several women in the class. They decided to do more research and um, and do their papers on on the women artists. And um, they had never heard of these artists, of course. And they just said, "Hey, you know, when you introduce them, they they you know they just seemed extraordinary." But I just didn't know how badass you know they were. Like once I I looked at their story and what they were doing and the obstacles that they had to you know go through. Um, and then when last last time I taught the class, when I added. Uh, Latinx, Mexican, and Latin American and South American artists. Um, there was a, um, a a young man in my class who said that he'd been taking lots of art history courses all throughout 
uh, he was graduating that semester, that last semester that, that he was in my class. And he said he just he took a lot of art history class. He just wasn't really feel, feeling very engaged. Uh, he's originally from Mexico and he said I, he just didn't you know, feel connected. And he said it just wasn't, he wasn't that interested. Um, and then he said, once I um, started, you know, once he, he took the class and I'm bringing in these artists and, um, and he, he said that all of a sudden he said it just like it, it made more sense to him, especially the, the Mexican artists. Um, so he got really excited. So, um, you know, sometimes, especially he really liked um, Jose Guadalupe Posada. Uh, he just really, really loved him. So he just felt really, really connected to him. So, um, so sometimes, you know, students, they, they're kind of shy or they're kind of quiet about their responses, but I just really am grateful when they express their enthusiasm about it. Um, there is a drawback that there's so many, you know, Euro uh, white male artists that I, that do printmaking that I, I don't have so much time. So I have to choose and take some of them out in order to do this, but um, forgotten history um, is a very um, important topic for me uh, in, in my teaching and also in my work. Excellent, great, Thanks. thank you, Irene. Does anyone else wanna answer this question? Otherwise I'll move on. I'll just, I'll just jump in really quick. Sure. Um, so we don't have punk arts or letterpress at UNLV. Um, I teach mostly typography and um, what I've been finding is a, a good resource to point students to is actually Instagram. Um, I can, let me see if I can share my screen really quick and just point out um, a few people that I usually kind of introduce the students to. Um, David Walker is an artist. I actually taught with him when I was in, um, when I was at Middle Tennessee State but he does um, these typographic pieces every single day related to something in the news. Um, Shantanu is another artist. Um, what I really love about his work in discussing with students is how he'll take other languages and incorporate that into his work and use color and certain typefaces um to help extend the message even if somebody doesn't speak that language um and then greg deal doesn't specifically work with type but he's a native american artist in colorado and um he will take old comic book images and change out the text to flip the narrative um, he also does these really amazing murals. Um, so those are the artists I usually point out to students um, initially. As um, Colette mentioned, I <laughs> realized after the fact that it was all men. So um, I am constantly on the lookout for um, non-male uh, biopoc artists. Um, but yeah, I just found that to be a really good resource for for getting students started, um, especially since pretty much everybody now has an Instagram account and is on it all the time anyway. Excellent, thank you. So I'm gonna move on to our next question. Um, how are the book arts, particularly books by BIPOC artists and publishers responding to current events? Have any of the um, artists um, on the panel started working on projects related to the pandemic or um, racial justice issues of 2020. Um, are you aware of other artists doing that? Um, and I'm, at, I'm gonna, happy to start us off and I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, so, you know, as I, um, you know, briefly mentioned, I think there are so many um, artists, um, collectives like, like our own who um, really flourished um, during the pandemic. Um, sometimes, you know, terrible times actually create amazing opportunities, uh, particularly to come together. Um, so this is the Rememory um, directory and it has uh, 
a little over 175 um, Black women and non-binary um, creators. Um, and this was actually um, a thesis project. Um, I believe she was at Pratt um, by Mia Coleman, um, who is a designer and illustrator. So I would say this is pretty extraordinary to bring people together and give them um, visibility. Uh, and I'm happy to um, put this link into the chat as well. Um, I would agree with Ashley's comment about Instagram. Um, it's a great resource. Um, I spend a lot of time on there as well. There's so many folks doing great things and um, you know, you start with one person and see, you know, who are they following? And you kind of, it opens up a lot of worlds for you. Um, and I'm gonna see if this will work. Can folks see the screen? Um, so um, some artists that I'm really excited about who I think have been doing some really interesting work um, are um, Tejin, um, Ikeda, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing his name at all. Um, he does these beautiful um, relief prints that are just stunning. So this um, What Dream um, is a recent piece that he's posted that is um, you know, just such a stunner. Um, and I'll include his uh, website as well, his website information as well, but um, yeah, just uh, beautiful your... work. Your screen is frozen on the Rememory project. So is it? Have, okay, yeah. so let me stop sharing. Thanks for letting me know. This is like my class sometimes. Can you guys see this of MLK? Awesome. Um, and then uh, another artist um, is Rosa Leff. Um, and she's a paper cut artist. Um, so, you know, she posted um, around uh, this sort of paper towel um, face mask that she created, um, but also, um, you know, this I can't breathe um, paper cut. Um, so I think so many of us are um, responding to experiences around us and trying to kind of understand what's happening, um, the real pandemic. Um, and I, I do agree that I think um, Instagram is a fabulous place to look for folks um, and uh, particularly sharing with students because um, you wanna kind of meet them wherever they are and what can be accessible um, to them. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. Um, does anyone else wanna share um, work that they might be doing or artists that are exciting? Ashley? Um, so I have a couple things um, real quick. Let's see here. Um, so over the summer after um, the murder of, of Floyd, I um, written a piece called I Am, I Am Not, and um, subsequently ended up having a solo exhibition at um, our on campus art museum at UNLV, um, the Barrick Museum. And, um, oh no, it's not letting me change it. Oh, there we go. Um, so it was great to be able to, to share this piece, which was specifically in response to um, an experience that Black Americans have had for literally hundreds of years, um, but some people are just recently becoming more aware of. Um, and because of this exhibition and this work, um, I was actually approached by um, an organization called Smart Growth America to work on a project here in Las Vegas um, for the Regional Transit Commission, which runs all the public buses in the city. Um, so I used my experience in typography um, and illustration to develop these outdoor signage pieces to 
remind people to keep their distance from one another and to wear masks. Um, and included actually going and interviewing people, um, collecting some surveys to see how people might talk to one another about how to stay safe. And so the language is more informal, things that you might just say to like a friend. Um, so hopefully by having these, um, these pieces around the, the main bus station there, people will be reminded to keep a safe distance and to keep their masks over their noses, um, but not feel like they're being beaten over the head with it. Um, so those are just a couple examples of, of what I've done recently. Excellent, great. Anyone else want to share what they've been up to? Irene? Okay, so I'll see if I can share screen. So, um, yeah, so 2020 was hard <laughs> for everyone. So um, I, I'm just going to show two things that I that I managed to to make uh, recently. Um, so this is um, a necklace that I made um, that, sorry, um, that I, uh, I wanted to rush to finish by Juneteenth. So by um, June 19th, 2020. And so I was just thinking this is another way, uh, you know, with, um, with all the Black Lives Matter that was going on in June, uh, this is like another way to like carry a sign. And I, and I was thinking, it was made out of paper that it can really be like any other word. I can make any other word or any, uh, or any, kind, of, uh, any kind of phrase as well. And so it's actually a book. Um, so it, so my thought is that people could write secretly behind each letter and then you can't see it in the necklace or they could write or draw over the whole thing. Um, and so, uh, so that's one thing I want to show you. And then the other thing is um, for New Year and for um, thinking of, um, that, you know, we're gonna get out of this pandemic. And we're going to have, um, a uh, hearty lungs, healthy heart. Um, and I have a, a, a peony that is uh, um, auspiciously positive um, as, a, as a Chinese symbol. Um, so I, I made this animation. I made 10 dry point um, for the animation, purposely for the animation. And then I had a, um, three older uh, prints that I uh, that I also use. So 13 printmaking prints to to um, do this. So I'm just going to show it's it's a little over a minute, but I'm just going to show uh, maybe half about half of it. Oh, and I just want to add that um, I'm very new to animation. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited about uh, pairing printmaking with animation, especially the storytelling type of uh, possibilities for it. And I um, also um, am interested in, in sound and also in ancient music, because you know, I, I mentioned that I'm very interested in, uh, in forgotten history. So it's not forgotten, but it's just not in the mainstream of uh, ancient Guqin Chinese instrument music. Um, and so I was influenced by music as, as old as um, 200 AD and, and up, and I, I wrote my own score and, um, and I wanted to use a, a instrument that I know, which is um, violin, to kind of stylize my plucking. So it could be kind of like the Guqian. So there's a, that's, that's the music that accompanies it. Thank you. 
so I'll just I'll just stop it there. Um, so I think of it sort of book like because it I feel like it's kind of like the the format of like a paperback book and the way it did the title the way I end it. Um, it I, I I see it as these these sort of pages that are that are streaming together, but it's the but it's a a peony flower heart that that starts off as a black lung but then gets well like it it becomes more abstract and and gets well um, by the end. So that's all I want to show you today. Thanks. Thank you, Irene. Um, Colette? Uh, sure, hi. Um, so although I've been continuously trying to make work um, since March, I and I, I work at home, so I don't need to go anywhere to work. Um, but I look back and I think how little I've actually physically done. Um, but uh, as, as everyone, you know, and time has gone by really fast. Um, but, you know, I took a lot of photos, I attended a lot of protests, and uh, I could, I never felt comfortable making anything with them. Um, maybe one day I'll be able to revisit and make something and they're always, all of this is in the, in, in my, in, in the background, but I haven't been able to actually make anything um, directly related to um, a lot of the political events going on right now. Um, but t two works that I feel safe to share. Um, that's not mine. <laughs> Neither is that. <laughs> um, well, so so I travel a lot um, for residencies uh, to China um, to teach, and I'm kind of addicted to traveling. And um, but these are some lack ye minority lacquerware products that were given to me when I was in my mid twenties when I visited China for the first time. I lived there for three years. Um, so for those of you that didn't hear me talk last time, um, my mother is of Yi minority descent and um, there are 55 minorities in China that a lot of people are not aware of and even within China are not aware of. So a lot of my work has been focused on showing th this diversity. But so this is, these are wine pots and on the right is, a, um, is the box that the wine pots come in and there's cups, cups with them. And um, so I, I started making my own designs inspired by the designs that were in the wine pots, bowls, tables, armors, shields, and these designs, I've been reading up about them and they symbolize things like the sun, the moon, the stars, rivers, forests, and animals. Um, and I've been playing around with uh, making a tunnel book with them and or possibly a wall sculpture and then uh, this is um, images elements of a tunnel book I, uh, not a tunnel book a star carousel book I started and um, the serpent in the background is part of a, a ritual that a bima which is a yi shaman paints to expel disease and the the um, these elements will become part of, this is the model of the tunnel book, of the carousel book. Uh, the copper border pays tribute to the mythical founder of Yi civilization who tames lighting, lightning with his copper helmet, bag and sword. And in the origin story, copper pillars are separated to separate the sky and earth. And then the model on the right illustrates how you'll see the star from the top. Uh, that is taken from a previous book I made on, on um, something. So that's just similar to how it'll be. Um, but then I, what I didn't realize, wh which I have on my table next to me is this card that I worked on, work, worked on for New Year's because I thought I was leaving for residency a few days ago. So I rushed to get this card out. Um, so this is the symbol for prosperity in Chinese. So, um, you know, F.U., uh, which is also my last name. So I hear it 
you know, it all the time. Um, and there's a, there, the, we're inundated with all these proverbs and posters and inspirational quotes. It's, I don't know, did I say speeches? But um, so I, I, I was trying to figure out what, what imagery can I put on my ox? Because it's going to be the year of the ox on February 19th, I think. And the ox is stubborn and he, um, he's gonna kick out, um, and he's gonna kick out the 2020. And um, so I was looking for quotes and at the time I was feeling kind of, um, I don't know what the word is, but so there was this quote that says, if you survived a storm, you will, you will, you won't be bothered by the rain. Uh, and then um, a friend said, or you'd have, it'd give you PTSD. And I said, oh, that's true. I never thought about that. Um, so I changed the quote um, to, if you survived a storm, you will still be bothered by the rain. And now I don't have to question if it's a, if it was indeed a Chinese quote, because now it's a um, Chinese American <laughs> proverb. Okay, thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Colette. So I'd like to move on to our last question. It's kind of a multi-part question. Um, how do library catalog, how do libraries catalog artist books and make them discoverable? based on standard and non-standard attributes, subject, maker, materials, technique, etc. What gets erased in library catalog records for artist books and how might that be improved? What kind of skills are required for cataloging artist books that differ from cataloging other types of book, text, manuscript, print objects? In terms of discoverability, um, libraries, collect discovering BIPOC artists, um, libraries making the, um, the work discoverable, um, you know, what can BIPOC artists also do to aid libraries in this effort? And just for the sake of time, I'm going to um, combine this with one other question. If that's not enough questions, then we'll go with one question. What role do historical and analytical bibliography have to play in current and future scholarly practice around artist books? Great, so um, I'll address the first question about library cataloging. Um, and so the first thing to understand is that every other guided by rare book cataloging standards, um, the way they decide to include different attributes of these books is ultimately up to the individual. And I think this is really one of the major uh, differences between uh, is that archivists tend, uh, tend to work with communities. They uh, reflect on community standards and values and then try to uh, engage in sort of reparative descriptions of materials. Uh, and so this is something archivists are often doing. Um, rare book catalogers in general, um, we must work on books tend to be much more isolated. We have an individual object and we make assertions about that object and then that object becomes discoverable through catalog. Uh, and so that means, you know, sometime, sometimes Devin, you've cut out. Yes, books in UCLs. UC oh. okay. Sorry. You're good now. Uh, You're good. Okay, cool. Uh, where, where did I drop off? Um, again, start your sentence again. Okay. Um, so sometimes I, I, I would say like, you know, an individual artist will be noted based on ethnicity or association with a particular political group, but that tends to be only if the book is explicitly quote unquote racialized in some way. So sometimes Tia's books are African-American art and sometimes that label is not included in our cataloging at a place like UCLA. And so I think that what we really need to do is start having more active conversations, both with book artists about what they want described uh, and a and approach it 
in the same way that archivists are doing sort of reparative uh, justice through descriptions. Uh, so we have to break that binary between book and archive or you know individual object and community and start having new dis discussions about what it means to do this sort of descriptive and cataloging work. Thanks, Tia, for that question. Um, as a book historian and textual scholar of African American literature, I'm, of course, invested in applying my methods to book arts. But what I'd like to share with you in the audience today is the idea that my methods also help us begin to question, indeed, what counts as an artist's book. What counts as an artist's book? Um, and what I'd like to propose here, which is really drawn from my research in progress, is that when we apply the lessons of textual study and bibliographical analysis to even industrially printed books, um, for me at least, it reveals a surprising investment uh, by Black writers in process and experimentation at the level of design. This point was driven home to me late this summer when, uh, as we've all been <laughs> experiencing, in a break during my quarantine, I decided to take a socially distanced stroll around the neighborhood. I went to my local independent bookstore and uh, it was mostly empty. And so I got to do what I typically like to do, which is to browse the shelves. Um, this was in the late summer. And um, I just happened to notice a book of which I have several copies, having taught it multiple times at the college level. And just being a, a collector of books, I, I do have copies of it. That book is Claudia Rankin's 2014 Citizen in American Lyric. I know that I have multiple copies of this, both in the office and at home, but something that day compelled me to pick up this copy. I turned to a facing page layout and was surprised to discover what I'm about to share you on this screen. Lamentably, since 2014, Claudia Rankin has been redesigning the facing page layout you see here to add names to this, if you will, living memorial of African-American victims of police and white supremacist violence. You can sort of understand why I was shocked uh, when I picked up this particular copy, which I scanned for you for today, um, in that independent bookstore and why I ended up purchasing it. Because for the first time since the publication of Citizen, again, lamentably, tragically, and shamefully to all Americans, Claudia Rankin has continued her memorial on the opposite page, which is to say page 135, to say in memory of Ahmaud Arbery, in memory of Breonna Taylor, in memory of George Floyd, in memory of Rayshard Brooks. Shame on us if this list has to go on even one more name, but shame on us for allowing um, our state of affairs in this country to let this um, layout even get to this point. Citizen, whether in 2014 or in 2020 when I picked up this copy, is not technically speaking an artist's book. And yet once again, because I knew that Rankin was invested 
in a certain project of racial mourning on these particular pages, um, I did what I normally do as a scholar, as a book historian, as a textual critic, and I honed in on these pages and I was able to detect something that made this book mere months, mere months after the killing of George Floyd, to say nothing of that of Rayshard Brooks, uh, appear in my hands as if it had been written yesterday, as if it had been written yesterday. So what I'd like to leave you with is this notion that even in industrially printed books, there is a vast and understudied history of Black and indeed BIPOC revisions to their own texts that in this case signify a project of mourning, a project of calling out the crimes of this country, um, but that in other cases, which I also study, are just as much invested in joy, in freedom, in liberation, in movement forward. And to the extent that we pay attention to these revisions, which often go silent, the artists certainly don't announce it, and their pub publishers often don't either, um, to the extent that these things happen, I'm asking us as scholars and artists um, to wonder how um, experimentation can happen even, the even in the most unexpected places in industrially printed books. So thanks for having me as part of this conversation. Wonderful, thank you uh, um, everyone on the panel. Um, I'd like to open it up for um, questions and we have a couple questions in the Q&A. Um, and this one is for um, Irene. Um, just a clarification, um, where, you, where were you adding artists? Was that in your curriculum, your reading list um, or somewhere else? And also, would you be willing to share um, those lists? Yeah, so um, yes, I, I added these artists um, in my curriculum um, originally for that course I, uh, I mentioned the, their origins and, and issues in, in print media. Um, but I've also um, have this list of artists for my other courses as well. Um, and I encourage people to read more and research more about these artists and also uh, write about them in an essay or be influenced by them when they make art. Uh, I'm totally willing to share the list. And, and actually, if, if there was like a community about it, because I'm, I'm looking for more artists as, to add to the list as well. So uh, going both directions, um, absolutely, totally love to share my list. Um, and, then the, and, then, and then the other thing is that I, um, I, I make work about it too. Like one, one piece I made was about um, the, from 15, from 1400s to 1890, 1899 um, women, about forgotten women artists. I, I made a piece about it. So I, I use it in my work as well. I see, maybe since I'm talking, I see the, the, the second question from Christina. Um, I can answer that too. Um, so let me just recite it for everyone so we're on the same page and then we'll snap right back to you. Um, so our next question is, anyone working on finding the work of neglected BIPOC um, in particular, and in particular women artists from the past? Um, these days we have the benefit of social media, but in the past, um, the work of many BIPOC artists was shamefully ignored. How can we revive their legacies? And we'll start with Irene. Yeah, so I just thought I'd start answering that question. Um, so the way that I did it was, um, I found it wasn't so easy to find these artists, right? Because they're not on social media, like, like, like uh, Christina was saying. Um, but what helps is when curators, you know, when they, and art historians and, you know, writers write about what they've researched so that, you know, there's documentation. Um, and also when there's exhibitions, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing this right, but I believe there was a, an exhibition on, on women master printmakers um, like before 1800s. And I believe it was at the Grawler Club in New York, there was, there was an exhibition. And, um, and I found all these um, engravers, all these women master engravers that I, that I um, started to put in my list. So from, from that exhibition. 
so I would say like in, in the community of, you know, we share our, our research and our findings and, and bring back these, these BIPOC and women artists in the past that are not getting, you know, uh, documented at the moment um, to kind of correct this and, and bring them back to light is, uh, is really, really crucial and important. I also think that um, a lot of um, book arts and printmaking, well, I would say more book arts institutions could do a better job of highlighting their own instructors and past instructors and past administrators who are also artists. Um, because um, I found in research that I was doing to sort of um, share with students in my class in the fall, the artist book uh, representing blackness, that there seemed to be um, you know, a number of um, black um, female artists, BIPOC artists who had also taught at different institutions. So um, like um, uh, the late Ruth E. Edwards or Ruthology um, uh, who founded um, Books in Black um, had previously taught at um, you know, the Center for Book Arts. And it would be nice for them to, to highlight her and her work. And, um, you know, if they have pictures of her at events to, to share that. So I think there are many different um, organizations and institutions who um, probably have a lot of information um, about um, different artists, um, but don't feel that they're significant enough to, to make public and share and um, really highlight. Um, does anyone, Colette, did you want to answer this question? No, is that enough? Devin? Yeah, I've got, um, so I think that there are a couple of things happening right now. Uh, and the first, and for me, one of the most important things is destroying the hegemony of an uh, Anglo-American book history of the United States. And this has to happen in multiple ways. Um, first, we have to stop assuming whiteness in historical narratives, which no one in this panel has a problem with. Um, but second, and I think this is harder for some people, is moving beyond English language as the primary medium of expression. Uh, and so that means we need to start getting more people involved in, say, the history of Cherokee printing, the history of Spanish language printing, the history of Chinese language printing in North America, to start discussing the ways uh, the polyglot print histories of uh, the United States uh, were in dialogue with the book arts. Um, at UCLA in particular, uh, I've done a lot of work with early Chinese printing in California by reading newspapers and finding titles in those newspapers. Uh, and as Kinohi noted, these, while they're industrially produced books, are interesting books with a unique uh, unique structural features that I think sort of defy expectations from either an East Asia perspective or a Euro-American perspective. Uh, and right now, Lizeth, Lizeth Ramirez and I are combing through early California Spanish language newspapers, again, trying to find advertisements for Spanish language books so that we can get a list so that we even know where to start looking for books being printed on the Spanish language press to see what dialogue there is between uh, graphic design, book arts, and just early, early Spanish language printing. And so there's a lot of even really fundamental work that needs to be done so that we can better situate individual BIPOC, BIPOC or female book artists within a broader context than just uh, a single teleology, uh, which is wedded to the white book. So I think we are at time. So I just wanna thank everyone on the panel for um, the time they've taken last year and this year um, and for everyone attending and past attendance. I'm gonna turn it over to Devin. Great, so thank you so much for coming today, everyone. And there will be a recording available with subtitles in the next couple of weeks on the BSA's YouTube channel. Um, and I will attempt to save the chat for people who are interested. And so in hopefully a few, uh, few days, we'll be able to send an email out to registered attendees so that you can see a transcript of the chat.
I just have to go through and take out my private messages because you don't want to know about the captioning drama. Um, all right, so have a good day, everyone.